All right, got another great episode of the podcast today for you, reflecting on these insane playoff matchups, and we're diving into the truth of the running back position. You do not want to miss this information. It's going to help inform what you do next year in your fantasy draft. Stay tuned. Make sure you like, subscribe, enjoy the show. This new year, focus on what's truly important to you and let HelloFresh take care of dinner with fresh pre-portioned ingredients and recipes delivered straight to your door. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with the code FOOTBALLER16 at HelloFresh.com slash FOOTBALLER16. We also want to thank Indochino for supporting the show. Look, every year, maybe you've got that style edit you want to do. Maybe you find that new pair of shoes that you like and you get it. Enhance. Yeah. Enhance. You want to let Indochino take care of your 2022 style edit, Jason. You can customize everything from suits to shirts to chinos and bomber jackets at prices more affordable than you might expect. We've all had the privilege of going through the buying experience with Indochino. And it is a privilege because I love it's my suit. so easy to do. And we're all, look, I'm, I'm going to say it in an unflattering way. We're all misshapen. We're, we're not all the same. That's true. We're all different. We've got a different, I got longer arms than you do. Yeah, I got bigger <laughs> bellies than you do. Right. Everybody's different, Jason. And uh, what's cool is they have custom fitted suits, shirts, casual wear, um, you can do, uh, you can go into their showroom and get measured, or you can do it at home and it all fits perfectly. That is the key. They start, uh, their suits start at 429 shirts from $79 with all the customizations included. Give yourself a style edit and set the tone for the rest of the year with Indochino. Get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more by using the promo code footballers at Indochino.com. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com, promo code footballers. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Uh, welcome in. Tuesday. January 25th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, and a cardboard bear this morning. Cardboard bear extraordinaire, Jay Grizz in the house. <laughs> very happy, Jay Grizz. Jay Grizz is very happy? Yes, yes. Why is, why is this? Because the Packers are out. Ah. And if I know anything about Bears fans, it's that they... They no longer really live for their own victories. They live for the Packers' defeats. I believe that our in-house Packer fan lives for Packer victory. Um, how'd that go, Jeremy? You are correct. That is why I am dead inside. Mm. So right here, right now, there's just no difference between your team and our team. That's true. No difference at all. There's a big difference. Is There's there? really no difference between you and the Bears now at this point. I guess there is a difference because they had one playoff game and they lost at home, and we had one and we lost on the road. Oh, that's true. So, so that's, that's a... less embarrassing. Okay. Also, we get a better draft pick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. You can watch the show. You can see the uh, real life grizzly bear at YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Jason and I got it on lockdown today, and uh, it's going to be fun. We had the Crazy. best, the best weekend of playoff football ever. So I take I, I take issue with that. Um, I don't <laughs> think it was the best weekend of playoff football ever, but I understand the. I understand. Like I, I feel like uh, obviously the Bills Chiefs game was one of the best games of all time, and and so I like take that, cut that little beautiful slice of pie out. And then look at the rest of the pie. Oh, you mean the Tampa Bay 27-3 comeback to the last second? What I'm talking about is the That's first... That's a good piece of pie, too. The first three quarters of every other game was pretty boring. It was like 16-16, to 10-10 10 to 10 in the other two games... The end was incredible. I think, what you, I think you're taking issue with the fact that the game doesn't end after the first, second, and third quarter. 
So they're probably less exciting for you on that regard. I'm just saying that it was not the world's best football, but every single game had the world's best ending. Um, in fact, I don't know if you know this, Andy. So the Vegas spreads total on this divisional round of the playoffs was a total spread of 15 and a half points, which was the lowest total across all four games of all time. So that's why we ended up with a 19-16 Bengals victory, a 13-10 49ers victory, a 30-27 Rams victory. Yeah, and it hit the under. It went, The total spread between all four games was 15 total points. Um, the games had incredible endings, and that Bills-Chiefs game will go down in inf infamy. I, Bills fans, I don't know how – I don't know how I would feel if I was a Bills fan. I don't know if you take any – like positive moral victory away because you were so good or if you're just purely devastated because you won the game and then well and we we talked about this in the studio earlier jay it look joe burrow could surprise us but he's a young quarterback a team that hasn't been there versus a veteran playoff team and they were going to face a veteran bills team or a veteran chiefs team this felt like maybe just taking the Super Bowl trophy away from Buffalo. And, you know, 13 seconds should be enough. You, if you score Shouldn't with, be enough. Well, yeah, yes. exactly. You, leaving only 30 se 13 seconds on the clock should have been enough to win. Squib kicked that ball, man. Why are you kicking it out of the end zone? Giving it's him a full 13. Incredible. And it, it brought up new comments from the NFL, the competition committee, saying they're likely to consider – Proposed changes to the overtime rules. This is how people get every time, maybe fairly, every time coin flip goes one direction and that, that team goes down and wins the game. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, the, the people that don't have a problem with it would say, hey, stop them. Stop them on defense. Don't let them score a touchdown. Win the game in regulation. You don't have to deal with the overtime rules. The reality is, is it, it would be nice to... I don't know what the solution is, but it would be nice to find something that uh, makes this more fair because I know the odds. If you, know you win what, the coin flip, that team more often than not wins the game. Yeah, you know what the the solution is. Everybody knows what the solution is. I really feel like it's – there's so many different ways we think about, oh, you, you make it a competition or get the ball at the 10-yard line or, or uh, yeah, blah, 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 rules and How about – and I, not in the regular season, but just in the playoffs where you can't have a tie. How about you just add a quarter? That's what it you should do. It goes to overtime, you add a quarter. And when that clock strikes zero, like yeah. the normal game, at the end of the fourth, who won? Yeah, and if it's tied, you add a quarter. It's, just play. Yeah, just and they play can football. Be they can be 10-minute quarters. I don't, you don't have to have a full quarter. I agree with that. I think that's how it should be. Um, but it wasn't for the Bills, and they couldn't stop. Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes, which is something many folks have said. So, real quick, let's just call it. We both have Kansas City beating the Bengals. Nothing against Bengals fans, yep. but you laid that out well. Yep. Um, in the other game, the 49ers will be taking on the Los Angeles Rams in a battle of the NFC West for the NFC champion. Who do you have winning that matchup? Kyle Shanahan has owned Sean McVay over the course of their head-to-head -head career. The early sportsbook line, by the way, Kansas City minus seven and a 53.5 point over-under, and then the Rams are three-and-a-half point favorites. Um, I know the storylines are there, and the 49ers could definitely muscle out a win. I don't think they can keep up with what Cooper Matthew Cup Stafford can and do. Cooper Cup <laughs> Just... can do. So I do think I'll take the Rams in that one. I think they'll end up um, making it to the Super Bowl, and I think we'll get Chiefs-Rams, which will be – That would be fun, man. Pretty exciting. More fun than the Niners. So who do, you, do you agree with I, that? I do agree. I, I think that the Rams come out on top despite the the head-to-head -head, uh, you know, in-season record. Get ready for Bengals 49ers Super Bowl then. Absolutely. All right. A uh, couple bits of news to get into before. It is a truth episode. So we are getting into the running backs today, talking about the truth of the top 10 running backs and were they consistent for your team? This year was very different. So yeah. getting a grasp on the position as a whole and these top guys 
and some names that are missing is, I think, pretty important going into this offseason. Not different in the fact that we don't get to talk about Christian McCaffrey on the show again. No, that, that's the same as last year, but he did win a footy um, in back-to-back -back years for the exact same award, which is... Now, is that in the mail for him? Oh, yeah, it's still in, it's still in the mail. It's very heavy. All right, uh, news for you, Jameis Winston. Knee surgery could be sidelined into training camp. Have you heard the uh, Sean, Sean Payton, Payton yeah. stuff? They're not sure. What he is his... not committed for 2022. Is he not under contract? Or is he just saying, like, I might just bail on the contract? I, I don't know. I mean, so that that's something to watch for because this – if Jameis Winston can't come back, and obviously you had the late season injury to Taysom Hill, if Sean Payton leaves as well, you're going to have a, a messy – situation there he's, on, that's he's probably under a contract yeah he's under contract through to 2024 at 9.8 million a year rob gronkowski said he would consider returning to the bucks even if tom brady retired even i think he's been quoted as saying before like i would never play for another quarterback um yeah so i i mean a bunch of coaches are getting interviews right now we do a coaching changes show over the off season letting you know implications for you know I think the big name out there, Brian Dable of uh, the Buffalo Bills, is going to be finding – he'll be getting a head coaching job someplace. Yeah, I don't I don't know how he doesn't. And um, sadly, it won't be the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, and so a bunch of that news is going on, but we're not going to speculate on who's going where just yet. Any other news you have? Uh, no other news, just uh, head coach speculation, like the fact that Nathaniel Hackett should probably go to the Broncos so that he can stay with uh, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> yeah that see that you asked me earlier today we can talk about that you asked me did my opinion change on my confidence level that Aaron Rodgers returns to the Packers um and I said yeah I think it's changed but I still believe he will so good news for you Al Borland I do think he will come back he's still playing at an MVP level obviously and the emotions of the offseason will go away he will utilize a couple of months to be in the headlines because oh, yeah. that's one of his favorite places. And then I think he'll come back. I think cooler heads will prevail. He'll come back and um, he'll he, try to do it again. He talked about in his press conference, he doesn't want to be part of a rebuild. He does not want to. And, and that insinuates that he needs the Packers to stay very competitive. And the problem with them is their cap situation is awful. Uh, right now, I forget how far – over the cap they already project to be, but they're gonna have to they're gonna have to make some major adjustments. And that's without Devontae Adams being under contract on paper. Uh so if they want to franchise him, they're gonna have to find even more money. So I think that's one of his worries is will this team be able to compete in twenty twenty two as it did this uh this last season? And if not Won't they need okay, based on that, maybe we won't get the drama then. Because won't the team need to know definitively what's going on if they're going to make uh, rebuild? Because if he's gone, they should rebuild. Oh, for sure. And if he's there, they need to make commitments to veterans and find a way through the cap situation the way that teams can. And his words were that he was going to have conversations with people there, take some time, um, and then he would have a decision before free agency. What was There you go. What was funny to me, though, is that – in in his mind in his world and maybe this is just truth it's his decision <laughs> like like you're, you're under contract for the Packers he's like I'll let you know where no, that's how it works at this stage of your career yeah and he could just retire you can always too. Retire. I mean this was like when Kurt Warner well he was under contract for the Cardinals for another year and it was the offseason was like what are you gonna do are you gonna retire you're gonna come back take your money that's fair um but you made a point just looking at target distribution in that game I mean he threw the ball to Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams and no one else you know, and the sucky part of that is that it didn't work. Their offense, you know, they put up 10 points. Um, and so I've always said, if I was a quarterback, <laughs> you know, if I've got a Michael Thomas or a, a Devontae Adams, I'm just going to throw it to him every single play. And Aaron Rodgers tried that out and did not put up a lot of offensive output. Granted, it was in the snow. It's hard to keep, compete with the kind of greatness that was behind center on the other side of the field. <laughs> the, the, yeah Jimmy Garoppolo and his winning percentage is disgusting you asked me how do we reconcile that better winning percentage than Pey Peyton Manning yeah um and how do you reconcile that with 
wins are a quarterback stat. Yeah, you have to say this is a team game with that what, stat. And what's obviously the special teams made the plays in this game. But um, I don't know how to reconcile it. The, the quarterbacks that I think of are the Trent Delfer seasons where the defense was like on another level and just broke the game. And so it didn't matter who was quarterback. That's the only time I can remember a, a player doing less. And, you know, I don't know. It was, it was kind of crazy. Has their special teams crew been fired yet? For the Packers? For the Packers. <sighs> Pretty bad. And, and Al, are you still with us? I'm still here. All right. Well, you just got all the truth you need about your Green Bay Packers. Let's get into the running backs. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Uh, when's the last time you've watched that movie? Oh, gosh. It's been... A few good men. 15 years? 10 years? I don't know. Do you well, remember it? I remember it, yeah. Yeah. It's a great movie. It's a little overrated. No, it's not. I, I'm not saying... Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I'd ask Al, but I know he hasn't seen it. I've seen it, and it is great. Yeah, it's a great movie. It's a very good movie. It I'm still just holds saying, up. I'm just saying it's a little overrated because that one scene is so great and classic. You that just it, have to have a take on everything, don't you? It's my job. You just got to have it's a take. It's my job. Um, all right. There is a great running back article by Matt DeSorbo up on the website, 25 running back statistics from 2021. You want to further deep dive the running back position after the show? I encourage you to go check that out. Very interesting stats. You talked about the running back position being different this year. The top 12 running backs for this past season mm -hmm. averaged 14.2 fantasy points per game. Gross. Which is the second lowest mark in the past two decades. That would be 20 years if you're listening at home. <laughs> Injuries to Christian McCaffrey, again, Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, they didn't help the situation, right? Because points per game-wise, those guys were not at 14.2 points per game. They were going to swing the the average uh, northward if they weren't hurt. Right, but they didn't make it into the top 12, um, at least you know, at least Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry. So it's one of those where your top running backs this year disappointed. Um, there were a handful, and, and obviously these are the first guys we're going to get into who were league winners, who were amazing, but the it, the list is so small this year. The running backs really disappointed people, and I think that next year you're going to see um, a lot more people trying out zero RB. Um, it, it worked swimmingly this season, um, but if you if you take a you know a wide enough viewpoint, I don't I don't think that um, we should overreact to one season of massive injuries versus, um, you know, we, we talk about every single year, the bust rate of running backs in the first, the bust rate of wide receivers in the first, it's slightly higher for running backs over wide receivers, but it's not that big a difference. Um, this year was really rough. To that point, then, finding, you know, if you go zero RB, you're finding value at running back late in drafts. And you could look to this next stat, which is, Seven running backs drafted in the top 200 this year. All but one outperformed their draft position. Yeah, the rookies were great. The Najee was drafted at RB11, finished RB4. Javante was, at, uh, you know, maybe not the superstar people hoped, but RB28 was where he was drafted. He ended up RB17. Michael Carter was drafted at RB35, ended 29. Chuba, RB55, ended 33. Ramondre, above his draft position, Gainwell above his draft position. Trey Sermon was drafted higher than almost all of them. In fact, he was drafted higher than Javante. Mm -hmm. uh, did not pan out for Trey Sermon. Well, I think what happened was you looked at the San Francisco running game and Kyle Shanahan's history, and you said, man, a rookie in this system without Raheem Mostert could dominate. And we were right. It was just, <laughs> it was just Elijah just, Mitchell. It was just the wrong dude, people. It was not the guy that you traded up for in the draft early. It was the one that fell to you late that uh, fewer people knew his name. Yeah, it is the the San Francisco running back situation. Here, here's a prediction for you for 2022. We're not going to know what to do. I predict we won't know because it just ends up murky every year. All right, uh, truth data. Let's start at the running back. One with Jonathan Taylor. By the way, we 
we're looking at consistency of the running back position. Great games. You're looking at a running back performance over 21 points. Good games, we're defining that as 11 or more. Bust games, fewer than seven points. Jonathan Taylor won the footy for the running back of the year. Number one in total points. Number two in consistency, which might surprise people. Um, 332 carries, 1,811 yards, 18 touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the consistency, if you remember the very beginning of the year, people that were the anti-Jonathan Taylors were victory lapping, right? You go into week three, and he had three, he had one mediocre week and two bad weeks, uh, and it looked like he was not going to be the dude that everyone dreamed him to be, and then he was the dude, and he was unstoppable the rest of the way. Never finished outside the top 24, almost almost never finished outside the top 12 at the position. He was as consistent as it got from that point on. So it was really the the first three weeks of the season where, if you remember, the Colts sucked. They were, I think, one and four to start the year, and then they got it together. They figured it out, and I think what they figured out is Jonathan Taylor is bigger and stronger and faster than most NFL people give him the ball a lot, and that's why he was, you know, mentioned in NFL MVP consideration. Um, going forward next year, I think you have to assume more of the same. Well, they, I think what you saw was a team finally committing lots of opportunities to him, and that, that was a pathway to victory. 41% of the time, great game. So 41% of the time, he scored over 21. 82% good, only uh, really 6% bust games. He was... Much like he took advantage as expected, he took mm -hmm. advantage of bad defenses. Ten points better against bottom sixteen defenses than he was against top sixteen, but he still averaged more than that top twelve average against those good defenses. Yep. And yeah, he's going to be. I think he'll be drafted the number one. I agree, I, but I, I don't know if he will be worth it. I think he will. I I I do. I, you know. Would Derrick Henry over the last couple of years been worth that number one pick other than sure, the injury sure, this sure. year? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that – Let me rephrase that. I don't think he necessarily has to be. Sure. That's I, what I mean. Is yeah. I think there are a couple names that you could put into contention, but I think he will be the number one. Yeah, if, if I have the one-on-one, it will be Jonathan Taylor that I'm picking. I think that they've found their identity in him, and that is what is important. It's the opportunities for – you know, you talk about – is it talent? Is it opportunity? Opportunity is more important. Well, you don't get much more talented than Jonathan Taylor, and now you don't get more opportunity than he's getting. So he is the one on one. There are, uh, you know, eighteen rushing touchdowns, the most red zone rushing attempts in the history of the NFL. Wow, eighty nine red so zone rushing attempts. If you want to, con if you want to talk about things that do fluctuate, you know, eighteen touchdowns is not a number that is easy to hit over and over again. And maybe you view him through the lens of like, okay, 15 is a foregone conclusion, and that's okay. But that those are numbers that can fluctuate. Absolutely. I, I think 10 is a foregone conclusion. Double-digit touchdowns, that's a guarantee if he plays. And so that that's a good enough baseline for me to know that a guy who could lead the league in yardage, who is involved in the passing game and obviously has a touchdown upside is – is awesome. Here's a crazy stat because it could have been more. Per Matt DeSorbo in the article, 18 different drives where he was tackled on a rushing play inside the five where he did not score on that drive. 18. So 18 more 36, almost touchdowns. 36 rushing touchdowns if they all come to fruition. That's, That's crazy. Pretty good. Yeah, and that, you know, he should quarterback situation in Indianapolis. Does that change the equation at all? It would change the equation, yeah. He's not going to be as good without Carson Wentz there if they pivot. I do not expect them to be able to pivot. I know they want to, <laughs> but you can want to change your quarterback. It's not easy to just go and find someone off the street that's better than what you have. Are you saying they're in bed with Carson Wentz right now? I am saying that they don't that they don't want to be in there that they are, yeah. Okay, speaking of that. We want to thank Helix Sleep for today. Oh, I see what you did. <laughs> for That's a comfy bed. <laughs> for supporting today's show. Oh, boy. That was that was a rough one. Um, look, you, do you sleep on a saggy old mattress? No. I've got a Helix mattress. Okay. All right, I'm talking more to the people oh, out there. Oh, okay. Because I'm sure some people. There was a, uh, a pickleball plan 
this weekend. We're supposed to get out and play some pickleball. And then all of a sudden you find out that somebody hurt themselves sleeping, which is what you do once you're like over 30, I guess. And um, look, we want to tell you about Helix Sleep because you can get the best sleep of your life. And it's simple. You fill out a quiz and everybody's different. And so your answers are going to be different. And then they match you with the right mattress because obviously people sleep differently. Jason, are you a side sleeper? I, a, be- a belly sleeper? I am a back and side. Okay. I'm a pure side. Al? Okay. Side. Side. Okay. So, I mean, if you sleep a different way, you probably need a different mattress. It's not one size fits all. Everyone's unique. Helix knows that. Different models, soft, medium, firm. Um, they, you know, maybe you sleep hot and you need that cool mattress. Maybe you, maybe you a- and your partner sleep differently. They, they factor that in. Absolutely. So you fill out the quiz and uh, bingo, bingo. You're matched with a mattress. They're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to our listeners at helixsleep.com slash footballers. That's helixsleep.com slash footballers for up to $200 off and two free pillows. And don't forget about Fantasy Champs. If you have taken home the title this year and you want to get a championship ring, a trophy, a belt, get that swag, rub your friends' faces in your victory as you should, um, you go to fantasychamps.com and you you get all of the best gear. I mean, it literally is the best of the best stuff. I just received um, half of my orders because I ordered several times <laughs> because okay. I just kept right. wanting to add to it. I got the custom rings. I just got the shipping notification today. I thought maybe you were pre-ordering for next year and the year after. I mean, I could. I just, well, I'm just <laughs> seven years in a row between our leagues. So here's what you do. Right now, they're giving a free championship ring that's a 59 dollar like super bowl style ring if you buy a trophy or a belt add them both to the cart and then use the promo code free ring at checkout and the 59 dollar ring will reduce to zero dollars just like that at fantasychamps.com check it out austin eckler was number two i'm so mad at him okay i'm so mad at him he oh, was, this is related to him coming on the show yes it's it, it, he was on my board as a my guy and I thought prior to talking to him that the opportunity for touchdowns could finally be there for him. He's obviously great. He catches the ball. He is a phenomenal running back. But will he get the opportunity? And I asked him that on our show. And his answer made me firmly believe that he was not going. He's like, you know. I'm putting that on you. Yeah. Because there was room for interpretation. He just said that coaches coach and players play, which you took to mean Maybe they won't give him that because the coach is going to have a different decision around the goal line, right? Yeah, yes, yes. I need to go back and re-listen to that and see if now in hindsight because um, here's the thing. He got he got a few red zone carries this year. He had uh, 20 touchdowns, all of them inside the red zone, and was dominant. He is the number one most consistent running back, even more consistent than Jonathan Taylor by our metrics. And was a dominant, dominant force. Yeah, number one, like you said. And battled through injuries at the end of the year, and it didn't matter. He still got into the end zone. 20 touchdowns, 12 on the ground. He was outstanding. 31% great, 88% good games. Busted zero times. So Played through injuries. Really incredible. Great at home. Seven points better at home. Great against bad defenses. Six points better against them. He's on a great offense. They've improved their offensive line. Herbert's getting better. Yeah, I was gonna say you got stability there. You got a coach that you trust. You've got that the the injuries dealing with them. It, look, they they were trying to find a compliment for him throughout the year. They were kicking the tires on Roundtree for half the year. They they tried to use Justin Jackson. They, you know, that they're trying to find a way to help him with that. But the nice thing though is that he doesn't need he doesn't need the 300 touches to be great. Like we saw that when he was on a pitch count and they used Justin Jackson and they brought him in and gave him workload. Still Austin Eckler was a great fantasy option in those games. Um I think he's going to be underdrafted next year. Because there's the injury guys that are I think all going to go ahead of him. Christian McCaffrey will be drafted ahead of Austin Eckler. Uh, Derrick Henry will be drafted ahead of Austin Eckler. And I don't know that that's fair to Austin Eckler. You've got a guy who is so consistent because of his pass-catching ability on a great offense as the dude used in the red zone. I I think the history 
of Austin Eckler is going to get in the way of the present. Um, and I hope to not make that mistake. I think Austin Eckler is worthy of that number two pick. The efficiency was outstanding. I think coming into the year, we said we thought he'd get 200 carries. It wasn't going to be much more than that. He got 206 on the year, you know, dealt with the injuries. I think he missed one game. Mm -hmm. But his snap counts are lower than the big guys, and that will be the persuasion against him. It will be the, the reason Alvin Kamara probably wasn't drafted where he belonged for a handful of years is Kamara was a 200-carry guy. Exactly. And you people want the 70-plus percent snap count, 300-carry running backs. And so, I, th you know, John the Taylor's going to go ahead of him. Yes. And he should. But I think there will be three or four or five guys that also go ahead of him. I mean, I think you're going to have uh, Chris McCaffrey, Derrick Henry go ahead of him. I think you could have Alvin Kamara go ahead of him, which is a great comp because they're very, very similar in their utilization and their talent. But one of them is on a really good offense, and one of them is on an offense that's dying. Wouldn't you rather have Austin Eckler over – Alvin Kamara? Yes. So it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see the ADP next year, but we'll do our best to make sure he gets the respect he deserves. All right, Joe Mixon coming in at number three, number seven in consistency, and that meant 44% great games, which was, I believe, higher than Austin Eckler, 63% good, 6% bust, 1,200 yards, 13 rushing touchdowns. You can make the same compelling argument about Joe Mixon in the offense and Joe Burrow and the in the consistency there that you could make for Austin Eckler. Yeah, and he actually will probably touch the ball more. He is more of that, um, you know, he's not going to be a 200-carry 200 200 yeah. guy. Um, so Joe Mixon will be in consideration. I wonder how much – Joe it had a really confusing season because even though he's the running back three, you, you said it, he was consistency rank only seven. And – 12th in the second half of the year, the, too. The first month wasn't great for him. And then when he got just caught fire, he let everyone down in the fantasy playoffs. And I think those people who had him are probably mad at him. The, you get in the playoffs and he has his worst game of the entire season. And I think people went into the season feeling that way about Joe Mixon anyways. There was a lot of the, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it with Joe Mixon again, camp going into the draft. So I think it'll be interesting to see where he goes. We were trying to kind of – we were throwing out names in the first round, running backs, you know, and it took a second to get to Joe, even though he finished at number three. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you value him in Dynasty because he's 25 years old right now. He has three more years under contract, but we've seen these second contract running backs fall off a cliff at some point, but he's tied to this great offense – this up and coming, and, and I would have to imagine, please, Cincinnati, your focus is your offensive line. That is your focus this offseason. And I'm not talking about in the draft. I'm talking about go pay up for whoever the best free agent guard is, the best free agent tackle. You have tons of cap space. You didn't like nine sacks for Joe Burrow in this last game? No, go protect him. Don't do what the Colts did with Andrew Luck. Don't make Joe Burrow retire in five years. Just go protect him. And if that happens, that's great news for Joe Two Mixon. Two more peak years. For Joe. I think two. I think that's how you should think about him in Dynasty. Would you trade for him right now? Would you go try to target him? Do you think he's going to be less? No, I don't think people are going to. I don't think you're getting a bargain No, on Joe Mixon. So I think he can have two more peak years with this offense in that team. So, yeah, I mean, you laid it out pretty well. He didn't quite feel like the number three overall running back. But he did give you a... High percentage, which I think is same uh, better than Jonathan Taylor in terms of 21-plus point games. So he would win you weeks, but he wasn't kind of somebody that people feared, I think, when they played against him, and you tried to catch him on a bad week. You tried yeah. to catch him when he finished 27th or 30th or 31st or you know, not the 2-4-3-2 two, two week uh, span that he had. Who would you rather have? next year well let me ask you this okay. well, let's talk about the the next guy Najee mm, Harris okay who would you have rather had this year if you could go back and draft them would you have rather have had Najee or Joe Mixon for this season that just finished up they scored you know about the same amount of fantasy points as each other um 
Joe uh, Najee was consistency rank four, but finished a little bit behind Joe Mixon. Who would you have rather had? It's a good question because Najee was so consistent in the first half, and that's our next name. He was number two in consistency over the first half of the year, which, I mean, that's when you're making your – you're establishing yourself for the playoffs, but then became less consistent over the back half. I think it's Joe Mixon by a hair just because the I, I want the – I mean – did Najee ever finish inside the top five on a given week until yeah, yes, week 14? So Week three, he was okay, running back three, five. Yeah. Week 14, he was running back four. And re week 17, he was running back two. So he did have a couple. But um, his obviously, if you're in a full PPR league, it's it's Najee for sure. You're talking about 74 receptions right. on 94 targets. Right. The real question to me, because he was as good as any running back this year, so consistent – what happens without Big Ben? Big Ben, you know, just... It was the Philip Rivers uh, dump-off situation. It was yeah. the Eli Manning dump-offs to it's, Saquon Barkley. Exactly. Um, no, it's a, it's a huge issue. That whole team, they're going to need to find a new identity. In ter you know, they don't... They're talking about giving the first-round tender to Dwayne Haskins. So that's where they're at. You don't need to do that, Pittsburgh... Yeah, I mean, that's that's where the, the Steelers are at, and it will make a difference. But you said this on the show last week. You kind of saw the worst you can you can get offensively for this team, or so we thought. And this was if this is the worst it gets, then Najee's pretty good. So I think in a half point, I'd be Joe by a little bit for that stretch in the middle of the year where he absolutely won games for you. But he was good against – you know, he's the first running back we've talked about that was equally good against good and bad defenses. So, when same, you touch same the, amount of points. When you touch the ball almost 400 times, you're going to be consistent. It doesn't matter if you're inefficient. If you get the ball 400 times, you're going to score a lot of fantasy points, and you're going to do it on the red. So, um, I, I like Najee, and I'm, I'm willing to draft him with a bad quarterback next year very, very high because the talent is there, and we know that they're going to give him the ball until he breaks down, which he is young enough to where he might not break down for a couple of years. Did you mention one of 11 running backs in NFL history with 300-plus carries and 90-plus targets? Exactly. That's. I mean, I didn't mention that other than saying he had almost 400 touches, and that's how it came. I mean, when you can get 90 targets, um, you know that this year was like the first year there was no 100-target running back Wow. this year, which is pretty surprising. Obviously, Christian McCaffrey going down hurt that uh, – Quite a you, bit. You wonder, though, if this will be one of those things where this is his peak touches ever in a season. Do you think the dependency on him was so high this year that this will be the most we see? It's hard to tell because I don't know how you could be less dependent on him next year. I feel like right. it's going to be more of the same next year. And what, about if, what about if the Muth gets loose? Oh, the Muth is just going to take Couldn't he it. steal some? He could he could steal a little bit of work, but I think you, you need people to step up and you need the Steelers to get better on offense for Najee to get better. I don't expect them to, but I think Najee does more of the same next year. And even with Dwayne Haskins or Mason Rudolph, I will still draft Najee with, with pretty much full confidence because their offense was bad this year and he was great. Yeah. If, he, if the target totals don't stay that high and they're equally bad, he will drop down a tier. Certainly. Only four running backs have led the NFL in touches as a rookie. Eric Dickerson, Edron James, LT, and Najee. That is quite the list. James Conner comes in at number five. Consistency rank of eight. But that consistency rank over the second half of the year was three. But he missed some games. So, I mean, you're talking about a stretch of, what, like six games there. He just kept scoring. 752 yards rushing on 200 carries, but 15 touchdowns on the ground, three through the air. I mean, he was better when they played a great defense. He just found the end zone, and I think he showed a lot of people that he had something, you know, he, he had something to prove it coming into the year, and he proved it. Yeah. And now he's going to make money. It seemed like James Conner was past his prime, obviously coming into age 26 usually for fantasy purposes, and this would obviously translate for NFL GMs and real football, running backs peak 
around 24 years old. That doesn't mean that they're dead by 26, but their peak is about 24 years old. And we saw that with James Conner coming in 26. I think people assumed the injuries had kind of caught up with him too much and he was a little bit washed. He had power. He had speed. He had vi he had Most everything that you want. tackles of his career. I mean, he was he was unbelievable. And Number one in pass blocking. You get down near the goal line, and it's he's a touchdown machine. When Chase Edmonds went down in week nine, that was when the opportunity was really given to him by the Cardinals to be the dude, and he dominated. So, obviously, for future um, purposes, there's two things here. One is, where is he going to be? Uh, wherever he goes, you know he still has juice left. If he's if he goes to a different team, we cannot view him the way that we viewed him coming into this season, which was he doesn't really have it left. I think you've got to give him the benefit of the doubt. But also the other thing is the starting running back for the Arizona Cardinals is a very valuable role. So if he leaves, and I believe Chase Edmonds is uh, not under contract Connor as well. Connor and Edmonds are probably two of the top five free agent running backs. Yeah, and it, it's possible. Like, if Arizona were to go out and spend a second-round draft pick on a running back or something, it, bring in Brees Hall, this would be a really valuable situation because they do, around the goal line, give it to the running back right up the middle. And, you know, you've seen a lot of touchdowns from Kenyon Drake and James Conner in the last two years. I think it is more likely – that James Conner is back with Arizona than it is that Chase Edmonds is back. I would agree. Let's say he's back, Chase is gone, they bring up Eno or they draft a yeah. six-round running back. What do you do with him in the draft next year? How high? Because he was the running back five. I think I think it would be – he'd be a running back eight to 12. So back of the first? I, I would lower him second. compared to his finish. Would you? Would you do that? 20% great game, 67% good, 13% bust. Uh, I, th I think I would have him in the first round. Because in the first round. So not, the, you're not talking about top 12. Yeah, if you look at what happened the first. It would be so scary. It would be so scary. Uh, that wouldn't be a confident draft pick. But if you look at what happened with him the first six weeks of the season when he didn't, he wasn't the really the guy. He was running back 44, 60, 12, 8, 31, and 32. You know, he wa he wasn't given that no, it's, opportunity. It's fair. Once he got it, he was just so dominant. So if he has it for a full season, I mean, you've got injury risk with him, and maybe he won't hold up. But he 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 had 15 touchdowns on the ground, three more through the air, and he was limited the first half of the season. Second most goal line carries in the league. Adding to your point about Arizona's running game, Zeke. Oh Zeke, what a bad year! Finished number six. 12th in consistency, though. Ninth in the first half, 20th in the second half. Played on a torn PCL. Did not give you prolific uh, finishes pretty much from week six on. You, your highest finish for Zeke from week six on was eight overall against Atlanta. He had a number 10 and number 10 finish in back-to-back -back weeks in weeks 15 and 16. But if he was your running back in the championship game, it was a huge dud against Arizona. He was better against better defenses, better at home. And, you know, the RB6, that's not how he felt, and that's not what you got, really. Well, it's it's skewed because of the injuries to the top guys. You know, Alvin Kamara and Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry and, you know. They, but he they wasn't graded on a curve this year. No, I'm just saying that, that, you know, on a per game basis, they were stronger. So if everyone was healthy, like Zeke is the running back six because he was healthy and great or played through injury, sure. you could say, if he wasn't necessarily healthy. But he was obviously disappointing. The utilization of Tony Pollard is not going away. Um, he might be their best running back now. And, you know, after the first five weeks of the season, he didn't put up 20 points the rest of the way, not one time in half point scoring. He's obviously under a massive contract. His contract is – he's owed a lot of money Tony, for a lot of years. Tony Pollard really doesn't concern me with Zeke. Why? Because, I mean – Zeke at this point in his career is a volume guy. And I think he will get the same amount of respect in future years on this contract as he's currently received. And if this is true that he played through injury from week five or six on, 
You know, you saw them turn to Zeke despite the limitations throughout the entire end of season and, and, and heading into the playoffs. So I, I just felt like they – I felt like the team probably overcommitted to him despite the injury, and that tells me that they're going to commit to him when he's healthy. Why, yeah. would, they, why would they change their tune if they were willing to play him when they shouldn't have been playing him already? Oh, I don't think they're going to change their tune, but the tune – so, for instance, so the last two years, he's had over 300 carries, which is like – or, uh, I'm sorry, over 300 uh, touches, which is what the dream is, right? Like, you, you are hoping – um, for massive workload in these guys. But the last two years, been 315 and 302 opportunities. The two years prior, he was up at 377, 390, 399. Well, yeah. If you grade him based on old Zeke. That's... But that's my point. My point is you're never getting old Zeke again. That's gone. You're not like the, the fascinating. You're going to have narratives because it's Dallas. And there's going to be a lot of publicity that he was playing with the torn PCL, that he's in the best shape he's ever been in. And you're going to have a lot of people hoping that you you have old Zeke back. And you, and I just don't okay, believe so that, that that's I think that's case. very fair. I think he, you, you're not going to get old Zeke back. You're not going to recover 370 touch. But I think if you give him 302 touches next year, you should get uh, this or better. You should get the running back 8 to 10. Okay. But you're saying better or worse on an efficiency level next year? I'm I'm saying same or worse. I don't think he'll get better next year just because of the whole PCL argument. He's going to get older. Uh, the Cowboys' offensive line is getting worse. I think the uh, counterpoint would be looking at that game log and saying until he got hurt, he was you know he finished eight, one, six, and six on the week. Yeah, the very beginning of the season, he was he was very good. You know, Carolina was a great defense. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a hotly debated player because there's fatigue with Zeke, there's age, more alluring, exciting options out there. And I think some of the names after him in today's show are going to be names that get brought up. When I'm in the first round, I'm everyone in the first round is good. I'm going for new hotness over downtrending. And Zeke is downtrending. So I will probably have him a few spots. Be I won't have him in most of my drafts, I'm assuming. You'll draft him over James Conner. Wouldn't I, you? Oh, that's... Yeah, I would... Oh, man. I feel like I have to, but I also think that that's the wrong decision. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like taking James Conner over probably... Zeke is too hot. Is But, like, at the end of the year... It's just you and you're alone in a room. No one can see what you're doing. No, no one. No one. It's just no I'm, cameras. No one's gonna talk to. It's just say, you in a draft. <laughs> I think I, if it was just James Conner and no Chase Edmonds, I think I go James Conner. They're the same age. I mean, Zeke ran for 300 more yards this year. Oh, that's tough. I think that'll be your debate. That, that and if we think Connor is going to go late, I don't think Connor's a first round. Player. Hopefully, at that point, I could take Cooper Cup. That's that's there that's who I want. You the probably first would. Round at that spot. Leonard Fournette ended up number seven, maybe the biggest surprise of the year in terms of what he represented to fantasy teams. Consistency rank of eleven, but in the second half of the year, his consistency rank was four. Twenty-one percent great, fifty-seven percent good, fourteen percent bust. And you know, we talked about Aaron Rodgers coming back. Any doubt that Brady comes back? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of doubt. He's at that 45-year-old age that he always talked about. He wants to play till he's 45. Um, it's not a guarantee he comes back. I think he does, but I, uh, there, I have no, I have no insider Didn't he information. Did he lead the league in yards and touchdowns? He led the league in darn near everything. He was unbelievable. He was the best deep ball thrower at age 44, uh, yards, touchdowns, everything. He's just – he's unbelievable. He he still has it, and he should come back. He should play again because this team is, is obviously a Super Bowl contending roster. From weeks 4 through 15, Leonard Fournette was the running back three. Three. I mean – he and here's the here's the thing. We said this during this stretch. We almost gave him an apology because Leonard Fournette has always been an inefficient, ineffective, volume based guy, and he looked good. He looked strong. He looked powerful, capable. His hands were soft. I think that um, I think Leonard Fournette's very good. Now he's not under contract, 
Ronald Jones is not under contract. Giovanni Bernard is not under contract. Um, they've got a lot of moving, changing pieces here. Did you see the quotes by Bruce Arians about that? No. He just kind of said that we're not looking to rebuild, we're looking to retool. But I think it was acknowledging, he kind of said, we'll see what guys want to come back, and then we're going to go from there. So it wasn't like last year where they just re-rolled the same. All, everybody came back right to, to try to run, run they, it back. They can't afford to do that this year, which is why this is one of the locations that I've been projecting a, a high-end running back draft pick. If they were to draft a high-end running back, that is financially how you replace the position. Because bringing back Leonard Fournette, Ronald Jones, you're going to have to you're going to have to pay for them. They're not going to just come back on a veteran minimum type of contract, but a rookie second round pick does not cost you that much compared to re-signing those guys. A big part of Leonard Fournette's game, 69 receptions. Nice. And so, you know, I think if Brady's not there, it's going to throw a lot of question marks into what made Fournette good. If Brady's not there, Fournette will be drafted darn near where he was, which was running back 40 in the eighth round. Right. Uh, the success of the Buccaneers is Tom Brady. My question is, if Tom Brady walks away, is Bruce Arian still a coach? I wouldn't be if I was him. He he walked away from Arizona when Kurt Warner left. He's like, yeah, thanks. No thanks. I know, and he's already committed to coming back. So it's... I think Brady's back. Yeah. I think the emotions will wear off, and he'll be realizing how good he still is, and... We'll get a year 45 Tom Brady. Oh, year 45. That would be great. I see. Not just age well, 45, age, yeah. but like 45 year years. Yeah, in the league. Let's go. <sighs> All right. We've got number eight, Alvin Kamara. <laughs> Alvin Kamara. What is the story of his season? What is the truth of Alvin Kamara? Sixth in consistency, eighth in fantasy finish, 23% great games, 77% good. And we got to see Drew Brees depart and tried to watch this offense function. Yeah, it it was it was okay with Jameis Winston, and then it was mediocre with Taysom Hill. Injury. Um in yeah, injury happened and then I believe you had a couple of horrific weeks um, later in the season against Tampa Bay where they were shut out. I think the following week in week 16 against Miami, was that where they had no quarterback? Oh, they yeah. were onto their umpteenth string oh, quarterback. Oh, you're talking about the uh, Ian Book? Yes, the, the, the Ian Did Book Did you see experience. how my uh, canvas print of that Ian Book interception came in? Uh, I didn't. Where is it? It's in my office. Oh, boy. You can come see it out. Right. It's not. I'll, I'll be honest though. I got it and opened it the day after I got eliminated with the Dalvin Cook play. So it really just. I was expecting to get that and that to be iconic in my championship, and it just it fell flat. You know who would have won that matchup? Not the Packers. Me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Would you have? You would have. Oh yeah. Won he he would have won the title if he could have. Yep. Oh man. Which all came down to what? What player could you have played and won? Amon Ross St. Brown. Correct. So have you thought? Have you rolled that one over? On a few sleepless nights? Sure have. Oh, yeah, that's tough. Um, so what is the truth of Alvin Kamara? We just talked about how his uh, consistency ranking was actually pretty darn good. He was the sixth best uh, running back in consistency metrics. And if you look at his fantasy finishes, most of the time he was a good running back. You had several, several top ten performances, um, several RB1 performances, you just had that month stretch in the middle of the season when he had the knee injury that really derailed things along with that two-game stretch of uh, terribleness with no quarterback and, and issues there. So do you end up drafting value Kamara? I do, yeah. I would take Kamara over over Zeke, no problem. If that's like a debate, if let's say even if Sean Payton leaves or whatever happens there – Nothing on the field. I never looked at Alvin Kamara and saw anything other than a dominant running back who was hard to tackle, who was quick to the edge. He didn't look like he had lost a step. Obviously, the offense was pretty putrid. Um, the uh, The scoring opportunities will be less, um, which they were this year. I don't think he's going to be a top three running back. But, I mean, it, even this season, he was pretty much on pace for that. He just missed a month of the season. He was He was on pace for almost 1,200 rushing yards, 
another 600 receiving yards. That's awesome. He had as many 15-plus yard runs as Zeke did this year. In fewer games. Yeah. Um, kind of a year where maybe as a fantasy player you put the all the externals away and you go back to the go back to leaning on Alvin Kamara again next year. Well, I, I think they have to. Uh, obviously, he's not built for the workload. They had a big problem this year with the backup running back position. They let Latavius Murray go because they thought Tony Tony James Jones Brooks Jr. would <laughs> okay would be a good backup, and then he got injured. And then they brought back eventually Mark Ingram, and that kind of healed it. But what they do with the backup running back, or even just running back at all, I think will be really interesting this year because they need to bring in another serviceable guy. Offensive line got worse. Four different quarterbacks. We talked about it. Um, but the, you know, they were ranked the fourth preseason uh, offensive line by Pro Football Focus. Ended up 18. So that doesn't help when you're making a quarterback transition to not have the same level of protection and blocking. Cordero Patterson ended up number nine. He was the waiver wire wonder footy award winner. That's crazy. He's the RB nine. Yeah. I mean, and he was the number one in the first half in consistency, ended up 14th in consistency. So how bad was that? That was real bad. It was 32nd in consistency in the second half. Basically what you should have done with Cordero Patterson genuinely, and maybe I would have, my season ends up different, is you should have benched him pretty much. You probably should have benched him from the halfway point of the year. I think you should have traded him. Well, sure, sure. I'm just saying like – I just mean like functionally, you would have been better off because what he was to you in the first half was never prescriptive for the second half. And you thought every – I did. I thought every week I put him out there, you were going to get these 5, 22, 21, 18, 13, 7, the number one most consistent player in the first half. I think what it says to me – is that when these guys come out of uh, an unexpected situation for first half of the year dominance, you should unload them. Remember how good Mike Davis was in relief of Christian McCaffrey? He was awesome, and he finished the year good, but he actually sucked the second half of the year. It was very similar to Cordero Patterson where it's like he finished top 10 at the running back position, but he kind of sucked the second half of last year. These guys who you just really don't expect to be good. Maybe when they have a great first half of the season, you capitalize on the trade value. You should at least consider it. And the truth is like no player needs this episode more than Cordero, because if you, if let's say you don't listen, God forbid you don't listen to the show. What an idiot. And you cut you, you go into the draft, you go into draft prep in August. Guess who was the number nine running back last year? Uh, I'm going to guess Cordero Patterson. Yeah, Cordero Patterson. I mean, if that's the metric you're basing it on, it's like, okay, I think we we would acknowledge based on the second half of the year, you know, if you had him, you know what went on. But if you didn't have him on your roster and you see number nine overall top 10 finish, I don't know. That's what can be deceptive. Well, and it's really a matter of whether or not he returns to Atlanta. He's a free agent. Um, I think that they know that they need to fix the running back position and they're going to go out and try to sign some guys or draft some guys. Whether or not he comes back, if they draft a running back and bring him back, which is what I think happens, I think he will re-sign because he's not going to have a better opportunity somewhere else. He became a fan favorite and clearly a an important weapon to the offense. If he comes back and they draft a third or fourth round rookie, what in the world do you do with Cordero? What is He's the, nothing. That's how I view it, too. It's the, it's the right answer. Plus, they, they're going to fix their wide receiver position. And by fix, I mean, yes, fix, because what they had last year was completely broken. Kyle Pitts, fixed wide receiver core, complimentary running back. The, everything changes for Cordero. He'll, he'll go back to being what he's been his whole career, which is uh, gadgetry. And I think that there will be a lot of players who draft Cordero high, hoping to get what they saw right. for a stretch this year finished as the running back nine. So if he does return to Atlanta, that's it's going to be a trap. What was so discouraging is that he was something that was working in the offense. And even then, once they got Russell Gage back, it was irrelevant. Yeah. They stopped throwing him the football. It's annoying. <sighs> Antonio Gibson, number 10, finishing out today's show. Consistency of 19. He was a turd. Okay. He was an absolute turd for fantasy. <laughs> because... I love Antonio Gibson. I absolutely think he's great. 
but he pretty much stunk the first half of the year. 30th he, in consistency. 30th in consistency. Wasn't very good. Uh, he had three games as a top 24 running back. So just basically a good, just like serviceable, not like he won you a week on the first half of the year. And then what happened was he got more and more injured. And so you go, okay, this guy sucked for the whole first half of the year and he's more injured. Yeah, you're going I into can't rely on him. I'm not going to start him. I'm not going to play him. And that's, that's what when it... he was good. So you're benching him, and then he's getting these really good performances where you know he had four top ten performances in six weeks from weeks ten through fifteen, and and I and every week was like I can't play him right. He's injured and he sucked all season. So that's why I just mean he was like one of the hardest players to know what to do with to make that decision. And hopefully you played him the second half of the year because he was very good the second half of the year. Um, but you went into every game going, ooh, is he even going to play this week? So what's the truth? What is the truth about Antonio Gibson? Because I think he's a phenomenal talent. I think the truth is he's a quarterback away from being what you want him to be. That's what I think. You know, you talk, you talk about what made these guys great. You know, the reliability of Burrow with the Mixon prediction or Herbert with Eckler's season. Gibson needs consistency on offense from the quarterback position. To give you a shot. Okay, so. He could be a year away from the Jonathan Taylor year where Naeem Hines was stealing everything and all of a sudden J.D. McKissick falls away because Antonio – but he also has to stay healthy. Absolutely. That's I, the I, other part. I agree with everything you're saying. They, If they're able to go and get a Kirk Cousins, Antonio Gibson will be a first-rounder and he'll be great. He'll be worth whatever pick you want to spend on him. But let's go with a more realistic – type of free agent acquisition because I think Fitzmagic is done I don't think Taylor Heineke is he is the answer to the question of who's bad at quarterback oh I thought he was the answer to the question of who's my backup sure that's a good that's a good backup but let's say they go and they sign <laughs> Mitchell Trubisky yeah, I'm not excited or Marcus Mariota so one of no. these guys who's Who's a? Uh, they're going to come in, and it's an upgrade from Taylor Heineke. I would I, say Mitchell I don't Trubisky, know if either of those would be an upgrade. I think Mitchell Trubisky is an upgrade, and I'm oh, obviously not a fan of Mitchell Trubisky. I think they'd be the same. I think you've got to give me a more compelling name than those guys. So if that's the case, then the truth is, the truth is, is you you're not going to be able to rely on him. Yeah, that's what your summary was. Right, you can't rely on him. Is he a great RB two to give you those big weeks when he scores? Sure, he had ten touchdowns again. He found the end zone a bunch last year. That's what got him as high in the rankings as he did, as he was. And then this year he still ended up with 10 touchdowns while being banged up. I mean, he fumbled, he got hurt, he was inconsistent. So the truth of Antonio Gibson is you're still waiting. If Sean Payton signs Mitch Trubisky. Sorry, what? Sean is, Payton? Sean, yeah, he goes to the Saints. Is he a good fantasy option? That is no, just I mean, it's fascinating just, to me. I think it would be identical to how you viewed Jameis Winston. He was decent for fantasy. Which I don't know if they want to go back to the retread. I mean, that you're naming retread. Court. Jameis Winston, former top pick. Mitchell Trubisky, former top pick. Mm -hmm. Marcus Mariota, former top pick. Here's a little spoiler alert. They don't get it back. They don't figure it out. They never had it, so you can't get it back. Okay, yeah. That's fair. I yeah. guess get it back. I was thinking about Carson Wentz being a top pick. That sure, but um, yeah. It, it look quarterbacks, man. You kind of need them. Kind of a big deal. I, I think if I were Sean Payton, I didn't have one. I might walk away too. Last week was last year was painful. Yeah, I think that is one of my biggest takeaways from this year. Is you know, and I've always believed this, always done this, but. It, to different degrees based on almost recency bias, but I need to remember more and more that I'm willing to be, I'm willing to draft the, the potentially wrong player by avoiding these bad quarterback led teams. I just don't want to tussle with bad quarterback play. Right. Which is another way of saying drafting players from good teams is a general, is a nice tie breaking principle for almost everything you do in fantasy. Because you want to be with opportunities. Yeah. I, but I, I think it's even more than a tiebreaker. 
I think it pushes people up from from below to above. Like I will move down and draft someone on a better team than someone ADP higher on a bad team. Yeah, I agree. All right, we are done for today, but never fear. We have another episode on Thursday breaking down the next group of running backs, finding out the truth. We also have a footcast on Thursday. You can find that at jointhefoot.com. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.